In this video, we put massive solar with lithium batteries on my trailer, journey to the redwoods for testing, and risk losing it all to a forest fire. We bought a used trailer last year and quickly discovered its old lead acid battery didn't hold up to even moderate use. So here's my plan. Chuck the lead acid battery and install enough lithiums for multi-day trips. Add a solar array for extended use, provided sunlight isn't blocked by trees. Lastly, install electronics to manage the system at peak efficiency. And though part of me wants the biggest battery my Bronco can haul, like anything, it comes down to numbers. I like to think of energy as little tokens because a battery bank can only hold so many. When we power something like a light, TV, or microwave, they use tokens from our bank. So the size of our battery depends entirely on how many tokens we want to use. For example, the LED lighting in my trailer uses about 10 tokens per hour. So if my bank holds a thousand tokens, I can run lights for 100 hours. The TV, on the other hand, uses 100 tokens per hour. So it would only run for 10 hours on those 1,000 tokens. But the microwave uses a thousand tokens per hour. So it could empty the battery in just one hour of use. To figure out the solar panels, I flew my drone over the trailer and took a picture with a tape measure on top. It showed I can fit panels rated for a thousand tokens per hour on my roof. So at peak output, I could charge a thousand token battery in just one hour. But sometimes it gets really hot outside and I want to be able to run the air conditioning to cool off. But it uses even more tokens than the microwave. So I'm planning for two lithium batteries rated for a total of 5,000 tokens. That should let me cool things down for bedtime and still microwave my dinner. Also, I should mention, my diagram is a little misleading. Voltage on a single solar panel can exceed 40 volts, which is way too high for 12 volt batteries. So we need a solar charge controller to tame things down. And most of you will be shocked how big the wires are for 12 volt batteries on a system like this. Distributing power safely with the right wires and fuses can be a bit of a mess, so I'm using something called a Lynx distributor to keep it tidy and in one place. Also, while some appliances like the refrigerator can handle both battery and grid power, others like the microwave and TV only work on alternating current like the plugs in our homes. Fortunately, many trailers come with a box that takes both kinds of power and sends it to where it's supposed to go. Mine does, but in order to give it alternating current, I need something to supply it called an inverter. Fortunately, Victron makes a MultiPlus that's not only an inverter for supplying AC power, but can also be plugged into the grid and make DC power for charging batteries when solar isn't enough. Honestly, there's a lot more a system like this can do, but let's get into the build and figure out where it's all going to go. Now, as an engineer, I'm used to using CAD to make sure things fit. Problem is, trailer manufacturers don't exactly publish their CAD models online, so I'm making my own from scratch. And while my wife fully supports the project, she doesn't want to give up storage space unless it's absolutely necessary, so I'm doing my best to shoehorn everything into the back and bottom of this closet slash pantry slash cupboard. According to the model, it should fit, but I know from past experience there's a really good chance I screwed something up. I should also mention, I'm not much of a woodworker, but in my defense, this isn't really wood. It's some lightweight concoction of sawdust and glue with a picture of wood wrapped over the parts that show. Oh, and it's held together mostly with staples. So I get to pound on it until the staples give up and unscrew the screws that are holding the parts together all while trying to imagine how on earth it's gonna fit back together. I told my wife I was only gonna remove a few boards, so I'm a little worried what she's gonna say when she sees I've basically gutted the whole thing. Well, too late now. One of my biggest concerns with this project is making sure heavy electronics can't come loose while driving down the road. Problem is, trailers are made to be as lightweight as possible, meaning there's minimal structure inside the walls. I'd hope for some metal support behind the closet, but no such luck. But there are square aluminum tubes at the top and bottom of the wall I can drill and tap into. My strategy is to attach long pieces of flat stock with a row of fasteners, then build my own internal supports off of that. 
It's a lot of work, but I don't want to risk having my trailer go up in a shower of sparks. The batteries themselves are 60 pounds each, so they need the strongest frame of all. I just have to figure out how to mount them and still route the water and ducting that originally went through this spot. Hefting them in there isn't easy either, but I managed to get them in there without wrecking it or myself. Man, not bad. I should also mention I'm in real danger of not finishing this project in time for our trip. A lot of surprise stuff happened this summer, meaning I got a late start on this project but I really don't want to be completing the install at the campground, so I'm pulling out all the stops to get this done. By the way, I know that MultiPlus doesn't look very heavy, but man, the transformer in that thing is a beast. But the most shocking thing about this install is the wiring. 12 volt systems are notorious for large wires, but this is ridiculous. But a 3000 watt inverter divided by 12 volts equals 250 amps. So 4 out wire is a must to safely transmit all those amps between the batteries and inverter without turning into a heater and wasting a bunch of our power or causing a fire hazard. I should mention I'm using all tinned copper wires and tinned lugs on every major connection on the project. We make a lot of trips to the coast and ocean air is not great on electronics. And I don't want to think about what hundreds of amps will do if these connections start to corrode. So it's exactly 11 days until we leave for the Redwoods, and I'm just now unboxing the solar panels from Sun Gold Power. I've never installed solar on anything, so I'm crossing my fingers we can get this done before we leave. Thanks to the CAD model, I'm pretty sure everything's going to fit, so I'm attaching mounting hardware before we heft them up on the roof. These two smaller panels didn't have holes exactly where I wanted them, so I'm drilling my own. Just be careful what happens when the drill punches through. Thankfully, it doesn't look like I did any damage to the panel itself, so I'm counting that as a learning experience and moving on. Don't do that. It's finally time to heft the panels up on the roof and see how good my measurements were. Looks like they fit, but to get the power inside the trailer, I need to drill a hole in the roof and mount a combiner box where all the wires can come together. I'm wiring nearly all but the two smallest panels in parallel because I know I'll be in areas with partial sun. Apparently series wiring can prevent a single panel that has sun exposure from doing its job, but we're gonna test that theory when the project is done, so stick around for that. Believe it or not, the scariest part of this project for me is drilling holes in a roof that doesn't leak, but it must be done. We're gonna drive down the highway at 70 miles an hour and can't risk one of these panels flying off. I'm putting plenty of caulking under each bracket around the screws to ensure there's no leak path for water to get in. The first couple panels were a little clunky, but by the end, I've got a system worked out. So there, with just four days left before our trip, the last panel is screwed down and ready to go. But there's one more very important wire yet to be routed, grounding everything we did to the trailer frame and the wire has to be big enough to handle the worst our system can deliver. So I need a hole in the floor big enough for a wire and lug. And this wire is almost $10 a foot, so I don't want to go any farther than I have to. But that puts it in my favorite place on the trailer, where the poo from the toilet comes out. But we don't want voltage differentials where they're not supposed to be, so time to suck it up and just get it over with and I decided to give my son the honor of removing the old lead acid battery as well as its connections to the distribution panel inside the trailer. There are a lot of wires back there, but I'm just gonna trust they're still routed exactly where they're supposed to go. Okay, we're not completely done, but far enough to start piecing the closet slash pantry slash cupboard back together. I think I even found the original screws that hold the doors on. With just two days left, I'm having my son fabricate mesh panels to cover the openings to the batteries that also function as air intake for cooling the electronics. I think they came out really nice. So here it is, completely installed and ready to go just in the nick of time. A little bit of planning for routing the wires pays dividends, and I'm really pleased with the results. My wife still has most of the storage she had in the first place, and the electronics have ventilation for when they need to shed some heat. We even added this decorative panel that permits quick access to the master battery switch whenever we need it. The only thing left to do now is put the system to the test, so we're hitching up the Bronco and heading for the Redwoods. 
We started our trip with full batteries, which means the solar panels have nothing to charge. But the weather's so hot, we're making a quick stop to switch on the air conditioning ahead of lunch. That way, by the time we're ready to eat, the trailer will be nice and cool. Oh, did I mention the Bronco air conditioning compressor seized a couple weeks ago? I quickly swapped in a replacement late one night that I've only tested in the driveway, so fingers crossed it holds up for the whole trip. Okay, time for lunch at a truck stop outside Eugene. The sky was clear up north, but smoke from distant forest fires is really blocking the sun. So let's head inside the trailer and have a look at the electronics. This Touch 70 display might be my favorite part of the install, so let's pause the video a sec and let me explain it. We see the inverter is powering the air conditioning with about 1300 watts of alternating current. That would be my tokens per hour we talked about earlier. Likewise, there's about 1300 watts coming out of the battery, which seems to make sense. But wait a second, the solar panels are adding over 400 watts on their own. Where's that going? Well, making alternating current from batteries isn't free. Nor is converting the 40-something volts of solar down to 12 or 13 volts. All that converting has to come from somewhere, and right now it's matching the input from our solar panels. And I know I said the panels are rated for 1,000 tokens per hour or 1,000 watts, but the smoke from the forest fires is severely limiting how much sun can reach the panels. No worries, we have so many tokens, or technically watt hours, in our batteries, we'll be just fine. And besides, the air conditioning doesn't do this continuously. In fact, it's about to cycle off and run the fan at a much lower wattage. I mean, tokens per hour. Oh, it just switched to fan, so it's dropping down to a couple hundred. And, uh... Wow, so we're actually charging the battery. Sweet! So we've got 400 because it's hazy outside. We're only getting... Uh, 447 watts there on the, the solar panels, but we're charging the battery some. But I don't have to look at that screen to monitor the system. The Serbo it's plugged into has Wi-Fi I can connect to with my phone. And it's not just reading the info, I can change settings as if I was touching the screen. But the batteries themselves have Bluetooth built in. So though there's no external plug, I can talk to the internal battery management system and check the individual cells, even if the system is powered down, which is pretty cool. Regardless, my family was able to stop for a quick climate-controlled lunch all to ourselves without firing up a generator or eating in the car, which is nothing short of miraculous compared to what we're used to. It seems impossible, yet here we are doing it. Okay, back on our way, braving triple-digit temperatures and hundreds of miles of beautiful scenery, culminating in our arrival at Panther Flat Campground, east of Crescent City, California. Even though we stopped and used the trailer air conditioning a handful of times, the solar panels got us back up to 85% before arriving at camp. Now I'm extra thankful for those big batteries, because with all these trees, we're not likely to get much more energy from the sun. It's still pretty warm out, but nothing compared to the 112 degrees I saw on our drive. So we're skipping air conditioning for now and focusing on setting up camp for the next few nights. There's supposed to be a swimming hole just down the hill, but we'll save that for tomorrow. It's been a long day and I just want to eat and get a peaceful night's sleep so we're ready for tomorrow's activities. But Mother Nature has other ideas. I should have brought my rain gutter generator. The long night made for a late morning, but it looks like the skies have cleared. I'm a little surprised to see the batteries down to 74%, but we did run a household fan for several hours last night getting fresh air into the trailer. Also, this trip has me paying way more attention to the other energy sources we brought with us, like propane for cooking. Before we left, I filled up two 15-pound propane tanks on the front of the trailer. That's three and a half gallons of propane at 27 kilowatt hours per gallon, equaling almost 95,000 watt hours or tokens of energy. That's the same as 19 of our battery banks. Or is it? 
To turn propane into electricity, we have to burn it in a noisy generator, which is only 20 to 25 percent efficient. 20 percent of that energy equals 19,000 tokens, which is only four times the size of our battery bank. Now, if we were heating the trailer or cooking, the efficiency flops the other way because heat is now our goal. On the other hand, back home, the solar panels were able to charge empty batteries in a single day. No leaving camp to go get more fuel. So in the end, it kind of depends on what you're trying to do. More on that later. And though right now we're only getting about 40 watts from our solar panels, the day is still young. I'm setting a camera on time lapse to track the sunshine while we head to the river to see if any of us are brave enough to swim. The water is a little cool, but once you're in, it's a nice break from the heat and humidity. I can't believe how clear the water is. It's getting close to dinner time, but we still really want to see the redwoods even for just a bit. We were hoping for a quick family hike, but apparently dogs aren't allowed on the trails, so we're going to come back tomorrow without our four-legged friend. Back at the trailer, we can see the batteries are still right at 74%. The highest solar input we ever saw was 78 watts, and that was only for a moment. But if I Bluetooth to my solar controller and go to history, I can see what really matters, which is the total energy gain for the day. Looks like we got 250 tokens or 250 watt hours of energy. That's substantial, but not compared to the 5,000 a day we got back home. So the trees are nice, but not a friend of solar panels. Realistically, we still could run air conditioning, but are choosing to use the box fan instead. For dinner, it's propane canisters for cooking corn on the cob, followed by burgers. I want to use electricity everywhere we can, but for me, burger patties need to be cooked over a flame. If you have an idea how to get that char-grilled flavor without hydrocarbons, please tell me in the comments. Oh my gosh, that's so good. We're ending the day with batteries at 64%, which is averaging about 10% per day. We only booked four nights, so at this rate, we won't come close to running out of electricity. There's smoke in the air the next morning and ash everywhere, which we're assuming is from a neighbor's campfire last night. But as we pull out of the campground, we spot something up the road. I think we found where the smoke is coming from. It's concerning, but we've got redwoods to see. I grew up in a small town and have spent a lot of time in the woods, but this is another level. I can't believe how quiet it is amongst these giant trees. They're 500 to 1,000 years old and over 300 feet tall. No wonder they were used in Star Wars Return of the Jedi as the forest moon of Endor. Flying my drone through the trees, I can't help but imagine the speeder bike scenes from the movie. I've been on the highway through this area many times growing up, but this is the first time I've ever stopped and hiked the trails. If you ever get a chance to visit, don't pass it up. It really does feel like another world. Then there's Crescent City, where we're walking the pier, getting some fresh air, and admiring the California coastline. I may have even had my first Sasquatch sighting. But we're cutting our leisurely walk short due to some alarming news. So we just found out the road to our campsite has been closed for fire danger, and it looks like it might be closed right before the campsite. So we are racing back to at least be able to get to our trailer and find out what the situation is. Can we get to it? Can we get the thing out of there? Will they even let us in there? So fortunately we have everybody. We've got our dog. Don't we're, miss the we're exit. Safe. Yeah, I'm not gonna <laughs> miss the exit. Uh, so we're probably 20 minutes out and we're gonna find out if we can even get to our trailer tonight and, and sleep there or not. We'll see. Probably not. But the closer we get to our trailer, the bleaker the situation looks. And just as we feared, there's a police roadblock preventing us from getting to our campground. Hey there. Oh, well, <laughs> it depends on what you have to say. Well, <laughs> not great. I've had better days, had worse. Uh, so it's closed a couple miles up. Fire's burned over the road. There's burning oh, trees wow. and rock slides coming down across the highway, so we can't even get firefighters here right now. Wow. Stuff, so. So heading? we're, uh, well, we're down from Oregon. We have our trailer at Panther Flat. Okay. So is that like right up, yeah. I assume? I will escort you up there, have somebody escort you up there. Fantastic. And, and, and it's evacuating yeah. everybody yeah. out? Okay. Yep. It's excellent. Uh, you can go ahead and head on up there right now. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, so the good news is we get to retrieve our trailer. We just need to do it and get out as quickly and safely as possible. We're telling our kids if there were any real danger, we wouldn't be allowed to do this, 
but honestly, we don't know the whole story. One thing's for sure, an empty campground means one less thing for the authorities to worry about. So we're bugging out just like they ask. But pictures online show plainly why the highway is closed. Burning trees, debris, and landslides aren't generally considered optimal road conditions. In spite of heroic efforts by police and fire, Highway 199 will remain closed for the next two weeks, forcing a lot of people to choose alternate routes to where they need to go. Though our route home is longer, it's a scenic drive along the coast, making the trip even more memorable. We're surprised to see multiple burned areas on both sides of the road, indicating we might have been stuck here longer if the timing were slightly different. After all that, I'm about ready to give my summary of the project. Because if you're watching this, chances are you're interested in the fundamentals of solar energy. Well, one free and easy way to learn more is Brilliant, an online learning platform that helps you learn interactively. When I first started this project, I wondered if Brilliant had any lessons on solar power, and wow, do they ever. Level four of the science course shows how solar panels generate electricity using photons and the photovoltaic effect. It even teaches you how to calculate how much solar energy impacts the earth and how little of it would be required to meet our energy needs. I'm truly impressed with the quality and depth of their content on solar power. But it doesn't stop there. Brilliant also has fun interactive lessons in math, science, and computer science. I like that no matter my knowledge level on a particular topic, I can find lessons that meet me where I'm at and grow from there. And because it's online, I can access it with my laptop or my smartphone from anywhere, including my camp trailer, basically any place with a data connection. To get started for free for 30 days, go to brilliant.org forward slash quintbuilds and the first 200 of you will get a 20% discount off a premium membership. I want to thank Brilliant for sponsoring this video and thank you for considering Brilliant. So what do I think of this whole project now that I've done the install and had a chance to use it? Well, let's talk about it from the top down, uh, starting with the solar panels. And, and by the way, I do have a smaller channel that seemingly nobody knows about. It's a big secret. Don't tell anybody. But that's where I'm going to go into a whole lot more detail on this install than would normally be on the big channel. There will be a link in the description if you want to check it out. But overall, the solar panels from Sun Gold Power work great. There are a lot of different brands out there you can choose from, and I can highly recommend Sun Gold Power. These things didn't give me any grief at all. I was routinely getting over 800 watts, which at this latitude, being this far north, is pretty impressive, especially this late in the summer as well. The Victron hardware and electronics, man, those were fantastic. You saw for yourself the details of that Touch 70 display, the connectivity where I can talk to them with my phone or have them hook up to the internet is, is pretty cool. Now, the folks at Victron wanted me to emphasize the importance of working with a local shop. So they connected me with a company called Artec, previously known as Just Roaming Design. Turns out Sam, the owner, is a Victron ambassador. Now, I didn't even know that was a thing, but this guy is like a walking encyclopedia of information about this stuff. Seems like every time I visited, Sam was showing me some cool new vehicle installation they were working on. Now, at Artec, they do sales, design services, integration, CNC cutting, and if you're a business, they do all sorts of manufacturing optimization and training services. Now, both Victron and Artec wanted me to stress the importance of working with a supplier that can help guide you through the installation rather than trying to wing it on your own. And take it from me, I'm an engineer that designed a knife throwing machine, but I've never done an installation like this before. So when I was stuck, like, how do I connect this part to that part? It was really nice to be able to just pick up the phone and go like, help. <laughs> which helped me get the installation done a lot sooner. So whether you use Artec or some other place local to your area, you just want to find a place with technical knowledge that you can trust to help you out when you get stuck. Sort of a there if you need them, but not if you don't kind of thing. And the batteries, these Power URUS, however you say it, they were fantastic. I don't even want any more battery power than I have. One, it's plenty. Two, I don't know where I would put them. I wanted to get as compact of a setup as I possibly could, and I think you'll agree, I did. For most camping, I just can't see needing any more power than these 5,000 watt hour batteries. There's plenty of energy there. I never had a problem with them. It's amazing the hundreds of amps that you can 
put into and pull out of these things and they just take it. It's no problem. So yeah, can highly recommend those batteries. Having installed it, having used it, I really think I would do it exactly like I did. I wouldn't change a thing. And sure, this isn't a cheap project. Now, some of it was donated, some of it was not. And just looking up the street prices for everything, including what I bought, it came out to just around $6,000. But look at what you get for that. It's this off-grid travel trailer that I will be using to do off-grid camping probably year-round. And you can bet if it turns out this video is popular, I will be doing follow-ups on how it all works out. But for now, I'm Quint with another one of my builds. Thanks for watching.